Hello students, today we are going to deal with the topic on hyperparathyroidism where the parathyroid glands are involved and these parathyroid glands are small glands of the endocrine system that are located behind the thyroid. There are four parathyroid glands which are normally about the size of the grain of rice. They are shown in the picture as mustard yellow glands behind the pink thyroid gland. This is their normal color. The sole purpose of parathyroid gland is to regulate the calcium level in the blood within a narrow range so that the nervous and muscular system can function properly. Although they are neighbors and both part of the endocrine system, the thyroid and parathyroid glands are otherwise unrelated. The single major disease of parathyroid gland is the overactivity of one or more of parathyroids that is hyperparathyroidism. The primary disease of parathyroid gland is overactivity that is too much parathyroid hormone is produced. This is called hyperparathyroidism. Under this condition of hyperparathyroidism, one or more of parathyroid glands behaves inappropriately by making excess hormone regardless of the level of calcium. In other words, the parathyroid glands continue to make large amounts of parathyroid hormone even when the calcium level is normal and they should not be making hormone at all. Overproduction of parathyroid hormone by overactive parathyroid glands that is hyperparathyroidism can rob you of your health making you feel run down and tired causing osteoporosis and many other serious problems. Fortunately hyperparathyroidism can be fixed with new minimally invasive surgery techniques in most people in under 20 minutes. What causes excess hormone production? The most common cause of excess hormone production is the development of a benign that is non-cancerous tumor in one of the parathyroid glands. This enlargement of one parathyroid gland is called parathyroid adenoma and it accounts for 96% of all patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. The most common situation is that one of the parathyroid glands has developed a tumor that is secreting all the hormone. The other three glands are small and are responding appropriately to the high calcium by becoming dominant. This out of control parathyroid gland is rarely ever cancerous that is less than 1 in 2500. However, it slowly causes damage to the body because it induces an abnormally high level of calcium in the blood which can slowly destroy a number of tissues. Parathyroid adenomas typically are much bigger than the normal pea-sized parathyroid and will frequently be about the size of a walnut. Approximately 3 to 4 percent of all patients with primary hyperparathyroidism will have an enlargement of all four parathyroid glands, a term called parathyroid hyperplasia. In this instance, all the parathyroid glands become enlarged and produce too much parathyroid hormone. This is a much less common scenario, but end results on the tissue of the body are identical. An even rarer situation occurs in less than 1% of the people who have two parathyroid adenomas while having two normal glands. This is very uncommon and can make a, the diagnosis and treatment of the disease a bit tricky. Symptoms of hyperparathyroidism Since hyperparathyroidism was first described in 1925, the symptoms have become known as moans, groans, stones and bones. Although most people with primary hyperparathyroidism claim to feel well, 
when the diagnosis is made. The majority will actually say they feel better after the problem has been cured. This can only be known retrospectively when patients are allowed to comment on how they feel several months after the operation. Many patients who thought they were asymptomatic preoperatively will claim to sleep better at night, be less irritable and find that they remember things much easier than they could weather when the calcium levels were high. In some studies, as many as 92% of patients claim to feel better after removal of the deceased parathyroid gland. Even when only 75% claim that they felt bad before the operation. Patients with persistently elevated calcium levels due to overproduction of parathyroid hormone also can have complaints of bone pains. In the severe form, bones can give up so much of their calcium that the bones become brittle and break which is called as osteoporosis or osteopenia. This problem is even more of a concern in older patients. Bones can also have small hemorrhages within their center that will cause bone pain. Other symptoms of hyperparathyroidism are development of gastric ulcers and pancreatitis. High levels of calcium in the blood can be dangerous to a number of cells including the lining of the stomach and the pancreas causing both of these organs to become inflamed and painful which leads to ulcers and acute pancreatitis. Another common presentation for persistently elevated calcium levels is the development of kidney stones. Since the major function of the kidney is to filter and clean the blood they will be constantly exposed to high levels of calcium in patients with hyperparathyroidism. The constant filtering of large amounts of calcium will cause the collection of calcium within the renal tubules which leads to kidney stones. In extreme cases, the entire kidney can become calcified and even take on the characteristic of bone because of deposition of so much calcium within the tissues. Not only is this painful because of the presence of kidney stones, but in severe cases it can cause kidney failure. Now potential dangers of hyperparathyroidism, severe osteoporosis and osteopenia, bone fractures, kidney stones, peptic ulcers, pancreatitis and nervous system complaints. The incidence of these problems depends primarily on the duration of the disease and its severity. Everybody will lose bone density which is progressive. Pancreatitis and ulcers are much more rare even though the majority of patients claim they feel just fine when this disease is diagnosed. Almost 80% of them claim to feel better 3 months after the problem has been fixed. Do not elect to undergo surgery or decide not to do so based upon how you feel. Remember the typical patient has this disease for several years before it was ever found because its symptoms are so silent. The good news is that it can be cured with a routine operation that carries a success rate of about 95 percent with a complication rate of around 1 percent or less. Some centers are even performing minimally invasive surgery for this disease which can be accomplished under local anesthesia. What tests may be done to check for possible complications? Once the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism is established, other tests may be done to assess complications. Bone mineral density test, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry sometimes called as DXA or DEXA scan uses low dose x-rays to measure bone density. During the test, a person lies on a padded table while a technician moves the scanner over the person's body. DEXA scans are performed in a healthcare provider's office, outpatient center or hospital 
by a specially trained technician and may be interpreted by a metabolic bone disease expert or radiologist, a doctor who specializes in medical imaging or other specialists, anesthesia is not needed. The test can help assess bone loss and risk of fractures. Ultrasound. Ultrasound uses a device called a transducer that becomes safe, painless sound waves of organs to create an image in their structure. The procedure is performed in a healthcare provider's office, outpatient center or hospital by a specially trained technician and the images are interpreted by a radiologist. Anesthesia is not required. The images can show the presence of kidney stones. Computerized tomography that is CT scan. The scans use a combination of x-rays and computer technology to create three-dimensional images. A CT scan may include the injection of a special dye called contrast medium. CT scans require the person to lie on a table that slides into the tunnel shaped device where the x-rays are taken. The procedure is performed in an outpatient center or hospital by an x-ray technician and the images are interpreted by a radiologist. Again, anesthesia is not needed. CT scans can show the presence of kidney stones. Urine collection. A 24-hour urine collection may be done to measure selected chemicals such as calcium and creatinine, which is a waste product healthy kidneys remove. The person collects urine over a 24-hour period and the urine is sent to a laboratory for analysis. The urine collection may provide information on kidney damage, the risk of kidney stone formation and the risk of familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. 25 hydroxy vitamin D blood test. This test is recommended because vitamin D deficiency is common in people with primary hyperparathyroidism. How is primary hyperparathyroidism treated? Surgery. Surgery to remove the overactive parathyroid gland or glands is the only definitive treatment for the disorder, particularly if the patient has a very high blood calcium level or has had a fracture or a kidney stone. In patients without any symptoms, guidelines are used to identify who might benefit from parathyroid surgery. When performed by experienced endocrine surgeons, surgery cures primary hyperparathyroidism in more than 95% of operations. Surgeons often use imaging tests before surgery to locate the overactive gland to be removed. The most commonly used tests are Sestambi and ultrasound scans. The Sestambi scan the patient receives an injection of small amount of radioactive dye that is absorbed by overactive parathyroid glands. The overactive glands can then be viewed using a special camera. Surgeons use two main strategies to remove the overactive gland or glands. Minimally invasive parathyroidectomy. This type of surgery which can be done on an outpatient basis may be used when only one parathyroid gland is likely to be overactive. Guided by a tumor imaging test, the surgeon makes a small incision in the neck to remove the gland. A small incision means that patients typically have less pain and a quicker recovery than with more invasive surgery. Local or general anesthesia may be used for this type of surgery. Standard neck exploration. This type of surgery involves a large incision that allows the surgeon to access and examine all the four thyroid glands and remove the overactive ones. This type of surgery is more extensive and typically requires a hospital stay of one or two days. Surgeons use this approach if they plan to inspect more than one gland. General anesthesia is used for this type of surgery. Almost all people 
with primary hyperparathyroidism who have symptoms can benefit from the surgery. Experts believe that those without symptoms but who meet guidelines for surgery will also benefit from surgery. Surgery can lead to improved bone density and fewer fractures and can reduce the chance of forming kidney stones. Other potential benefits are being studied by researchers. Surgery from primary hyperparathyroidism has a complication rate of 1 to 3 percent when performed by experienced endocrine surgeons. Rarely patients undergoing surgery experience damage to the nerves controlling vocal cords which can affect the speech. A small number of patients lose all their healthy parathyroid tissue and thus develop chronic low calcium levels requiring lifelong treatment with calcium and some form of vitamin D. This complication is called hypoparathyroidism. The complication rate is slightly higher for operations on multiple tumors than for a single adenoma because more extensive surgery is needed. People with primary hyperparathyroidism due to familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia should not have surgery. Monitoring Some people who have mild primary hyperparathyroidism may not need immediate or even any surgery and can be safely monitored. People may wish to talk with their healthcare provider about long term monitoring if they are symptom free have only slightly elevated blood calcium levels, have normal kidneys and bone density. Long term monitoring should include periodic clinical evaluations, annual serum calcium measurements, annual serum creatinine measurements to check kidney function and bone density measurements every 1 to 2 years. Vitamin D deficiency should be corrected if present. Patients who are monitored need not restrict calcium in their diets. If the patient and healthcare provider choose long term monitoring, the patient should drink plenty of water, exercise regularly, avoid certain diuretics such as thiazides. Either immobilization, the inability to move due to illness or injury or gastrointestinal illness with vomiting or diarrhea that leads to dehydration can cause blood calcium level to rise further in someone with primary hyperparathyroidism. People with primary hyperparathyroidism should seek medical attention if they find themselves immobilized or dehydrated due to vomiting or diarrhea. Medications Calcimimetics are a new class of medications that decrease parathyroid gland secretion of parathyroid hormone. The calcimimetic Sinacalcet have proved by the US Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of secondary hyperparathyroidism caused by dialysis, a blood filtering treatment for kidney failure and primary hyperparathyroidism caused by parathyroid cancer. Sinacalcet has also been approved by the management of hypercalcemia associated with primary hyperparathyroidism. A number of other medications are being studied to learn whether they may be helpful in treating primary hyperparathyroidism. These medications include biophosphonates and selective estrogen receptor modulators. Which healthcare providers specialize in treating primary hyperthyroidism? Primary hyperparathyroidism is treated by endocrinologists, doctors who specialize in hormonal problems and nephrologists, doctors who specialize in kidney disorders. Surgery for primary hyperparathyroidism is generally performed by endocrine surgeons, head and neck surgeons, ear, nose and throat surgeons. Organizations that help people with primary hyperparathyroidism may have additional information to assist in finding a qualified healthcare provider nearby. Some of these organizations are 
listed in the medical books eating diet and nutrition eating diet and nutrition have not been shown to play a role in causing or preventing primary hyperparathyroidism vitamin d experts suggest correcting vitamin d deficiency in people with primary hyperparathyroidism to achieve a serum level of 25 hydroxy vitamin d greater than 20 nanograms per deciliter research is ongoing to determine optimal doses and regimens of vitamin d supplementation for people with primary hyperparathyroidism for the healthy public the institute of medicine guidelines for vitamin d intake are people aged 1 to 70 years may require 600 international units people aged 71 and older may require much as 800 international units of vitamin d the iom also recommends that no more than 4000 international units of vitamin d be taken per day calcium people with primary hyperparathyroidism without symptoms who are being monitored do not need to restrict calcium in their diet people with low calcium levels due to loss of all parathyroid tissue from surgery will need to take calcium supplements for the rest of their life